Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to focus on an entire hemisphere that so far we have not really talked about in this class, the Western Hemisphere, specifically the Americas. Now when we talk about the earliest inhabitants of the Americas, the Native Americans, we point to several sources for where these earliest peoples likely came from. Intriguingly, within recent years, a second Viking settlement, for instance, has been discovered off Baffin Island in present-day Canada. Now, likely, th these were mostly uh, fishing expeditions, um, various voyages throughout the 10th and 11th centuries that probably brought these peoples kind of to the edge of the coast of what we think of as present-day Canada. These were not peoples that were coming over to settle permanently in the Americas. And likely there were already human inhabitants in the Americas uh, that already existed by this point in time. And we'll talk about where they came from just a moment ago. But it is interesting to see that recent archaeological evidence points to some early visitors from Europe in this fashion. But the Vikings, when they did come to present-day Canada, likely encountered peoples that were already here. When we think about the first permanent settlers in North America, we point to the theory uh, that during the last major ice age, when the earth significantly cooled, uh, sea levels dropped in some areas by as much as 360 feet, exposing in some areas uh, land, dry land, that in normal, more temperate times would normally be covered by ocean. And we think this is the, uh, this was the avenue, the so-called Bering Strait, a land bridge that was exposed between what is now present-day Siberia and East Asia and the present-day state of Alaska, that it exposed during this last ice age, it exposed an area whereby hunter-gatherer peoples, which all humans were at this point in time, about 20 to 30,000 years ago, they were likely following migrating animals that came across this newly exposed strip of land, or actually it was probably covered with ice during that point in time, uh, but they followed it, they followed the herd animals down into what will become known like, much later as North America, and and then over succeeding centuries as the earth heated up again and the ocean waters melted and this land bridge or ice bridge no longer was now covered by ocean water, it sort of sealed off the peoples that had moved into the Americas. And gradually over time, the first residents, inhabitants of North America will begin to follow southward through what we think of as Central America and ultimately they will end up in South America as well. We know very little about who these first migrants to the Americas were. Uh, we even don't know a great deal about who their successors were, sometimes hundreds and hundreds of years uh, later, because we don't have very many Native American peoples that will develop a written language to complement their spoken language. So what we have to rely upon is the work of anthropologists and archaeologists, those who can interpret petroglyphs, those who are looking at the skeletal remains of who these earliest peoples are, their tools, their weapons, their trash. Uh, this is what gives us a little bit of a glimpse into who these first peoples were. And the first distinct culture that we can really sort of get a handle on is that of the Clovis peoples, who lived sometime between about 15,000 to 12,000 BC. And these were likely among the first wave of peoples uh, that began fanning out across North America. We often think of them as big game hunters because they were hunting huge animals, uh, woolly mammoths, mastodons, bison, and if you'll notice, of those three animals that I mentioned, two of them are extinct today. While we still have bison here in North America, woolly mammoths and mastodons uh, went extinct over time. And historians and archaeologists, zoologists, believe that these animals were likely hunted to the edge of extinction, that these early Clovis peoples got so good at fashioning weapons and uh, learning how to sort of trap these animals and slaughter them in large numbers that they likely led to their extinction over time. 
What we will see is gradually as the descendants of the Clovis peoples continue to spread out across not only North but Central and South America is eventually we're going to see the development of agriculture in the Americas. It's going to come a little later here than it does in other areas of the world and that's because these peoples will have been shut off from trade and contact with many other civilizations who might have learned agriculture before them and then they could have simply piggybacked off of these other people's accomplishments. We don't have that in the Americas. So it happens a little bit later. We think sometime uh, between the 6th and 4th centuries, or excuse me, 4th millennium uh, BC. The staple crop in the Americas that will learn to be uh, grown will be corn through a process that we call today genetic modification of crops. Uh, they didn't call it that back then, but they're going to breed varieties of corn that have much, much larger kernels, that have larger cobs, that uh, will result result in what we think of as the modern day corn crop. They will also modify uh, bean crops, gourd crops like squash, pumpkins, what have you. Uh, sunflower seeds, they'll, they'll breed newer varieties of sunflowers that have larger kernels. In South America, you see tribal peoples there beginning to learn how to cultivate potatoes, tomatoes, chilies, uh, cacao from which uh, co uh, cocoa or uh, chocolate will be derived as well. And I want to say just a word or two about the fact that you will, over many thousands of years, you're going to develop uh, a lot of different cultures across the Americas. This, for example, is just a language map of North America, just one of these continents, at the time of Christopher Columbus's arrival during the late 15th century AD. And if you'll notice all the different languages that were spoken here just in North America, if, if I you know, expanded this out to Central and South America, you'd see hundreds of more uh, different dialects and languages that were spoken. And this speaks to the diversity of the peoples as they developed unique cultures over thousands and thousands of years. Now we don't have time obviously to talk about the many hundreds and hundreds of different societies that developed over time, but I do want to say a few words about some common threads, some common characteristics about many so-called pre-Columbian uh, Native American tribes, those that were here before Columbus's arrival. First and foremost, the importance of family connections. We've seen this with virtually all other human societies to begin with. Uh, the fact that you are part of a much larger network of people you are not an individual striving for individual attainment. Instead, everyone's labor, everyone's insight was needed to make these societies go. So very, very strong and extended family connections were at the base of these societies. When we think of gender roles in many Native American societies, we often point to men's primary duties as hunting, a military protection, protection of their hunting grounds, uh, negotiating alliances with other chiefdoms, uh, these being the primary roles for men in many Native American societies. For women, theirs is largely food production. That includes deciding when and where to plant the crops, what crops to plant. These are critical decisions in many of these societies. Uh, women were responsible for child care, uh, in many cases for also maintaining the structures that, that kept them out of the elements. Another common characteristic of many of these societies was their political organization, which was known as a chiefdom. This was overwhelmingly the choice of most tribal peoples throughout the Americas in how they chose to align themselves politically. If you'll notice, chiefdoms were relatively small, maybe 25, maybe 50 square miles in diameter. They, the chiefdom was comprised of typically several towns with each village paying tribute to support the chief, uh, who would be the, the main decision maker in this case, and his family. And oftentimes there were blood ties as well between these various towns within a chiefdom, second cousins, you know, aunts and uncles, these sorts of things. And the figure of the chief himself uh, was that of usually someone who was considered to be a hereditary leader. Uh, he would be follow, following uh, the father before him and he would then pass on that title to, to his son. And by semi-divine, I mean someone who was considered to have a link to the spiritual world. Not considered to be a god themselves, but someone who was tied to the gods. And speaking of another common characteristic of pre-Columbian societies, that was their animist religious belief. 
Now, we've spoken of animism before in the context of African civilizations, the belief that spirits animate the world around you. And for many Native American peoples, uh, there was a tremendous emphasis on ritual dance, on certain ceremonies, prayers, sacrifices, all in an effort to tap into these powerful spiritual forces uh, in the world around them. As a testament to how important their religion was to them, here literally in our backyard in Georgia, um, up in near Cartersville, you'll, if you visited the Etowah Indian Mound site, you'll notice that for some of these tribal peoples, they will create earthen stepped pyramids uh, to, to oftentimes hold religious ceremonies at the top of them. The chief's home might be located at them. And some of these structures are quite large. In southern Georgia, you have the Okmulgee site in, in uh, Macon that you can visit as well. For ritual burial purposes, those high-ranking members of these societies would sometimes also be interred or placed within these mounds. So you can see that the importance of their faith was such that they were willing to undertake sometimes very, very massive um, uh, land reshaping projects. Sometimes uh, these would take, historians and archaeologists estimate, many, many years to complete. They're reshaping the earth around them. Cahokia is the largest of these so-called mound building sites here in North America, and it is located just outside present-day St. Louis, Missouri. This site uh, perhaps contained uh, a, a very large population at one point in time, lying as it does along the banks of the Mississippi River. The uh, land here is very, very fertile and can support the growth of many crops, which is why we see an abnormally large number of people living here, uh, probably between about 600 and 1400 A.D. The site contained more than 100 of these earthen mounds, the largest of which, Monk's Mound, uh, you can see a picture of here in this, this aerial photograph today. That's not a toy car. That's an actual road with an actual full-size uh, vehicle on it. You can see how very large this one structure uh, was. It measures 92 feet high, 951 feet long, 836 feet wide. It measures 14 acres at its base, and archaeologists believe that it likely took some 14 million baskets of dirt, each one taken one at a time and dumped, go back and get another one, to construct this massive mound. And, and like I said, here there's more than a hundred uh, of these earthen mounds at this site that you can still go visit today. Moving to a little further west here in North America, the Anasazi culture is sort of the parent culture, if you will, that will give way to a number of tribal peoples, such as the Zuni or the Hopi or the Pueblo peoples. Uh, these people will adapt to a much drier climate. They will develop a, a type of corn, for instance, that can grow with far less rainfall than what is typically needed. They will make adobe structures from the ground beneath their feet. You can see the Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde Park in Colorado where they're using a natural outcropping as sort of a roof for uh, this settlement here. Uh, they brilliant at adapting to their environment. Moving further south in what we think of as the Yucatan Peninsula, the Mayan civilization, uh, probably the most advanced of all Native American peoples over time. And I say that because they made advances in a number of areas such as astronomy. They, unlike the majority of Native American peoples will develop a writing system to complement their spoken language, a sort of a pictographic system like hieroglyphics, uh, inscribing them into stone disks. They will develop an incredibly accurate calendar system that will have a lot to do with their year of religious ceremonies. They believed if certain ceremonies weren't practiced on exactly the same day every single year, the cosmic chaos would result. When we think of their political organization, the Mayans lived in a series of city-states. They do not live in chiefdoms. Unlike many other societies as well, they lived in, in separate political units known as city-states. You can see they were also pretty advanced when it came to architecture. They will create stone pyramids, these stepped pyramids, at the top of which they will hold many different types of ceremonies. We're not sure what happened to the Mayan peoples, whether it was ecological disaster or what have you that led to their demise. It still remains a mystery. 
The Aztec Empire, which developed a little later in the Central Valley of Mexico, will have Tenochtitlan as its capital city. Theirs will be a centralized empire uh, headed by an emperor, a society based on warfare. That is what they did to subdue other tribal peoples. They too will practice uh, a human sacrifice, as did the Mayans and Toltecs and Olmecs. Um, and with the Aztecs, we know what led to their demise. It was the arrival of the Spanish. Unfortunately, the same thing will happen with the Incans. When the Spanish arrive, their civilization will...